thinking. Um, so just to um, give you some background of why I care about this is um, I'm a slow runner. <laughs> but one of the things that I have done is that I really care a lot about software design. And uh, sometimes uh, it appears to me that when we're designing, we don't have enough time or we get interruptions. And I also have a uh, dual major in psychology and computer science. So back in the last century, um, I got a double major in, in those. And so I found that reasons for how we make decisions and how we think and how we work really affect the way I think about design and building things. Um, so uh, I started at Tektronix long ago, who made oscilloscopes, and I was an engineer there and then went on to do other things and write books. One of the things that's relevant to this audience, though, is that I am the program director of the Agile Experience Reports program. And so I am always soliciting shamelessly people who are wanting to tell stories about their experiences. In fact, it will help you do that and you can retain copyrights to those. And if you're interested at all in writing about your Agile experiences, because that's a great way for other people to learn, please contact me. I mean, it's, it's really a rewarding program. Um, uh, people get shepherded as they write a paper that they own and we publish on the Agile Alliance website. And it's a very interesting way for us to learn and share our experiences. So anyway, with that, so uh, one of the things that we're going to talk about today is Daniel Kahneman's work about thinking fast and slow, but we're going to talk about it in terms of an agile context. And, and so um, first of all, you have to know what it is. And uh, it's not just a popular buzzword, although Kahneman's book got a lot of press. And, but it, I find that there are serious and interesting implications for agile teams and how they work together. And that um, our brains are what they are. And um, it would be great if everything was logical and worked great and was perfect and we, you know everything, all our thinking was was productive. But there are there are things that we uh, don't do well at. Um, there are things that we um, have some drawbacks in the way we think. Um, they have some advantages, but they also have some disadvantages. One of the things that we'll get into, I hope, is, is talking about decision making as well. But also, uh, you know, Linda's talked about uh, mindset, but also reframing is a, is a way that you can get uh, more effective at, at making decisions and doing good things too. But first of all, I want to um, introduce the ideas of fast and slow thinking. And uh, what's your reaction to this? All right. Scared. What else? Cute? Okay. Who, who thinks it's cute and scary? Yes. Right. Okay. So my first reaction to this was, whoa. Right? I had a reaction. It was visceral uh, when I um, saw this picture. And uh, you know, there's this bulging eyes of this dog. Now, I have to tell you a little bit about who this is. Right? This happens to be Peanut. And he was this year's winner of the 2014 Ugliest Dog Contest. <laughs> but Peanut has a very interesting but sad story. He was an abused dog. He was a rescue dog. I mean, there's a reason why he is somewhat ugly scary, because he was bashed and battered. Um, he's really a sweet little, dis you know, has a very sweet disposition. Um, and you know, there's part of a reason why why he looks this way is because he was abused. Um, but that's just a you know, he has bald patches on his body. I could go into this, but just his face is enough to make me scary, cute, but whoa. And I have a reaction to that because my system one thinking operates almost automatically. I mean, I can't help but have a reaction to this. Um, and that with little or no effort or sense of voluntary control, I have a reaction, right? I have a reaction. And uh, in, uh, 
best thinking, that's one of its strengths. You know, it's, it's something that just happens, we have reactions, uh, it's automatic, it's spontaneous, we can make connections to things, it's impulsive, you know, it's, um, you can loosen it up when you have more alcohol, right? So you know, a lot of you're just doing this fasting game. And it's emotional, right? I have, an, you know, I, I have an emotional response to this dog. Now, once I told you more about peanut, I hope you feel a little kinder, or, you know, it's not so scary anymore. Um, but uh, it, we quickly make associations between what we see and our reactions. And our associative memory is very powerful and works very well. In fact, it's good at doing things like... Wow! Um, it's very good at locating the direction of a noise. And a noisy person, thank you, Linda. <laughs> All right, so it's really good. We can, you know, swivel, swivel our heads and figure out where it is. Um, it's really good at doing things that, you know, we think are automatic. Um, you know, the way we perceive objects is such that, you know, things that are smaller are in the distance, so we can think uh, that those shapes there are in different orders, that the smallest one is further away. Um, we, so we can really relatively quickly determine the distance between things. We can actually do arithmetic if we're not, you know, if we're an adult, we can do, or, you know, not a little tiny kid, we can do arithmetic without even thinking. Um, we can drive on a road that's narrow, I mean, but, but if it's straight and there's not a lot of traffic, and so, without even thinking, and sometimes, I don't know if you've done this, I have, I've been driving on a very business, busy road <laughs> without even thinking, you know, and how did I get where I was, you know, because I was just doing something else, that's my system one thinking. Uh, going in. Uh, in fact, we can do some highly skilled, what seem to be highly skilled uh, tasks because we have such strong associations. We see a pattern on the chessboard if we're a chess master and we know what the move is. Right? Um, and we're not really doing deep thoughts, we're doing this associative quick kind of thinking. Um, one of the things that uh, we can also do uh, with our system one kind of thinking is uh, you can recognize phrases that just kind of come out of the air uh, uh, and, and hear, you hear them without even really thinking that are in your native language, um, which is kind of an interesting uh, experience when you travel to a language or a country where you don't speak the language, you, like, you feel all of a sudden it's quiet, you know, because all these people are talking but you have no idea what they're, what they're saying. And since we can do these strong associative kind of things with uh, system one thinking, what do you think about when you see this job snippet of a description? What what association do you make with that? What? <laughs> <laughs> Something done by an HR person, right? Who thinks? I think that you know is it wants someone for an agile team, right? Okay, no way. Uh, we form a quick association with it, and we might be do a yeah. But we form an association just like that, right? Without really thinking, uh, without conscious mental effort. Our brains are always working. In fact, both system one and system two, um, uh, are, the way Kahneman talks about it, uh, you might get the misimpression that it's a you know part of your brain, but it really isn't. It's there are many brain activities going on, but the system one are characterized, parts of your brain that work this way are characterized by these kinds of fast, emotional, impulsive, knee-jerk, quick association, find things out, just, and they help you, right? Because if you're in the right context, you can make these judgments and, and move on pretty well. Now, slow thinking, and I happen to come from a programmer, a developer sort of background, um, think about busy waiting, you know, it's my mental model of, of slow thinking, system two thinking. So when I say slow thinking and system two, they're equivalent. So if I slip in between one or the other, that's, that's what I mean, is that it takes effort. And so it tires us out. Um, when I uh, do system two thinking, it's quite a different feeling.
feel from these sort of knee-jerk reactions. Um, I am working at it. Um, I oftentimes do uh, logical kind of, you know, crunching kind of thinking or reasoning about stuff, uh, which I don't just have knee-jerk reaction to. I have to go through a thought process. I have to concentrate, which means if you interrupt me, you know, <laughs> it's really bad. Um, and that um, it's self-critical in the sense that I'm always looking at what I'm doing to think about what I need to do next. You know, and so it's, it takes a lot of effort for this system two thinking. Um, now, one of the things, to give you some examples of, you might be surprised when you're doing system two thinking, uh, is that, and this is a picture from uh, the Agile conference, is if you're in a crowded, noisy room, just to think about this, and you're trying to have a conversation with someone, and there's all this other stuff going on, you really have to focus and concentrate, and you're using a lot of system to thinking, so you take some more energy doing that. Um, so sometimes, I don't know if you've had this happen in your office or not, how many of you work in an open kind of office space? How many of you ever, who have to do this deliberate kind of work, put on headphones, when you are working. Okay, most, well, quite a few. How many of you in your organization is considered antisocial if you have to put on your headphones? I know that some people, they, they say, well, no, developers shouldn't do that. They're, being, they're not being part of the team. I don't know, I've, I've seen that happen. Um, there's a reason if I'm doing deliberate stuff that I want to, it requires intense con uh, concentration that I don't want to, I want to shut things out. It turns out that some people can shut things out better than others, you know, right? I just don't hear the noise of other people talking. But someone like me, everything is an interesting conversation. <laughs> you know, so it's like, oh, if I really have to concentrate. So, so one of the things, and these are from the uh, 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 level of difficulty to more difficulty, is you know just concentrating on two people you know, having a conversation with one other person in a crowded room where there's a lot of noise takes system two kind of thinking. Uh, it, it also turns out that um, if you recognize a sound, you know, that takes some, you know, you're not just making association, but you're like identifying a surprising sound that takes system two thinking because you're going checking through, what is this? What is this? I don't know what this is. Uh, so one might think uh, actually even in the parliament you know, the situation, were they sure that something was gunfire or not? Might have taken system two thinking before they figured it out. One wonders why didn't they respond quicker? Well, I've been thinking about it. It turns out that walking faster than you normally do, or in the case of me, a slow jogger, running faster requires focus and attention, right? So I have, have to consciously do something that's system two thinking. So whenever I'm doing a new task where I don't know what I'm, you know, and I'm speeding it up or doing it faster, that takes system two thinking. Turns out, um, parking in a tight parking spot, you know, or I really remember what I'm going to have to do. That's system two thinking. Um, more system two thinking, you might think on the logical side, is when I'm calculating, you know, filling out my tax returns. Um, I don't know in the U it, Canadian tax returns can be as bad as U.S. What? Yep, yep, sure. yep, yep, yep. <laughs> Even with TurboTax, you have to reason through how do I get to that number that I can put there. So it's still really hard. Um, and, and then finally, kind of like the Uber uh, kind of uh, slow thinking that really is hard is when you have to follow a logical argument, right? Um, and I, I can, uh, if you can't see this, it's worth saying this. And, and Thad, the Thad Guy comics are really great. I like KCB comics and I like Thad Guy. He says, modal logic is special because it uses statements that are qualified with expressions like necessarily, possibly, or sometimes. 
modal logic solves some problems. In a complex modal argument, many will naturally expand at least one claim beyond reason. When claims are irrationally expanded, many will accept an unreasonable conclusion. Therefore, numerous people are likely to accept the conclusion of a complex modal argument. Convincing people is the largest obstacle to solving problems. Therefore, modal logic can solve all problems. You got that? <laughs> Now, how many times have you had conversations with a customer or someone getting requirements where you felt like you'd gone through this sort of, um, what, what are we really saying here? Right? I don't know if you've had that experience, but I know I have. All right. So, uh, you know, following a logical argument and seeing whether it really uh, makes sense is hard system two thinking. And even keeping it on track can be hard. Um, now, it's not just that we're either system one or system two think. That is not the case. We're not just emotional or logical, logical beings, and we can't just flip the switch between one and the other. In fact, um, both systems are operating at the same time, and oftentimes, system one knee-jerk reactions feed into your system two thinking that's going on. So it's, it's, it's a little more complicated than just saying, well, I was, I was just had this associative reaction. It's like even my system two thinking is affected by my emotions and feelings and what's going on. So we are really complicated, messed up beings. <laughs> and so in fact, okay, so system one is sort of saying this. It runs automatically. We're not, we're not in control of it. We have no control over it. Um, now, system two kindly, is, since it's hard work doing system two thinking, it normally, given, given normal conditions, um, unless we're highly motivated, we want to idle and not do system two thinking. We want to avoid it, because it tires us out. But we, we can't do it intensely all the time. Uh, so it normally runs around in a comfort, low effort mode unless you're someone who has a job where you're required to do that a lot. Programmers are definitely in that space. I know I am as a programmer. Um, and, um, but, so we're idling along, but if we have some kind of emotional or associative reaction to something in our environment, it sort of feeds in and uh, messes with our system two thinking or impacts it with, without us even being aware of it. Um, and uh, so sometimes system one is being that logical thinking, it might say, oh, no, that doesn't make sense. Um, that system one, um, you know, you might have this irrational fear, and then it calls on system two to help it out. Um, and system two is that, that hard, tiring work is monitoring and being self-controlling, which is another interesting fact. So if you tire, get tired out, you become more cranky and emotional <laughs> and irrational. Uh, if, you, uh, if, if, if you detect that something isn't quite right, then it kicks in and you want to slow down instead of having these knee jerk reactions. So it's a very complex um, set of thinking that goes on in the brain. So what I'd like you to do, uh, since we're, we're sitting here uh, just talking about it, is to have a conversation with people, someone next to you at the table, um, just think about the things that you do during the day, if you're doing agile development or just your work or your life, and um, what kind of thinking that they demand. I mean, what, what, how much of what you do is, you know, this, and, 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 and you know, what, 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 do you, what kind of tasks do you do and what, what kind of brain systems are you using when you're doing that? Okay, so why don't you have a five minute conversation about your practices and things that we do. We don't work together. I don't work together.
immediate fire? You need to react immediately. It's not like... Uh, yeah. That was that was an interesting conversation and I was having one with Linda right uh, as as you were talking about this. Uh, we, we wanted to have this demonstration of a loud reacting to a lot of noise. And we had this happen to us yesterday having a conversation. We were in deep conversation talking about, I don't know what, this doesn't matter, important stuff. And there was this noise, uh, couldn't figure out really what it was, and it was repeat, repetitive, very loud, it was a person. Um, but we kind of, our first reaction was ignoring it. And then we realized, oh, this is a person who seemed to be yelling. Uh, yeah, yeah, again, yeah, what's going on? And then my system one kicked in and says, oh, that's probably somebody who's drunk or something, right? Just first associative kind of stuff. And yeah, Linda goes, yeah, they're annoying. And I go, oh. There's a Tourette syndrome conference in the hotel. And it was someone who had Tourette's making noise. Now that took a while to get to that point of, you know, oh, I made a deep connection, not just, but our tendency is just to be in our little context making free associations or that. But, but we like shut it out until we noticed it and then we formed a quick reaction to it that was wrong. And then it didn't seem quite right. So our system one was having trouble. It didn't seem right. So it, our system two kicked in. And then I got something that made sense. Whew, that was a lot of thinking and flipping back and forth between the, the stuff that was going on there. And I, and I was you know, thinking about, yeah, the shooting. It's like no one expects that, right, the sound or whatever. Um, so anyway, it's a very complex interweaving that goes on with this thinking all the time. So how many of you in the audience do have to do what you consider a lot of system two thinking on the job? All right. Okay, not, not that many. So uh, how many of you uh, kind of have to react, make quick impressions, but then also have to switch from time to time? kind of switch yeah. and um, do you always know when you're switching what's going on it's, it's a very interesting dynamic isn't it so if I think about some of these agile tasks all right um, you could you can say well specifying acceptance criteria you know might involve some thinking right <laughs> uh, programming to me is oftentimes a, a system two uh, uh, kind of thinking. Uh, but if I'm doing TDD kind of testing first, then maybe I don't have to do a lot more thinking. I just write simple code, and it may be just like a chess move, I know what to do. Right? So I can do the same task, actually, and the way I do it can even affect what kind of thinking I have. Uh, that's just something that I've observed in myself. Um, checking in code obviously doesn't involve any thinking. You know, I just kind of have this GitHub. Uh, good for me. Um, some things, um, you know, are quite deep. You know, if I'm doing exploratory <coughs> testing, how many of you are testers here in the audience? You think that's, it's, it's, you're building theories as you're going. I mean, it's, it's not just poking around. I, I, my, one of my favorite books, and it's actually not a, not a bestseller, was uh, playing different roles in order to do testing. You know, the role of the detective, the role of the, you know, and, and it's a very interesting way of getting into different mindsets to get in, into deeper thinking about uh, stuff. I started out life at, at Tektronix as a, as a test engineer, so uh, that's one of the things that comes back to me. Um, sometimes, uh, 
conversations involve this quick reactions, right? I have associations, I make decisions, and sometimes they're deeper and I have to logic through. Um, so, so that's a, an intro to um, fast and slow thinking, and I want to talk about some more facts about these, right? In that, and I want to make a, a, a comment about biases and flaws and flaws in perfect reasoning or thinking. Um, in that, um, it's not that it's bad or good; it's just how we work. And some people, um, uh, under certain contexts, exhibit certain co cognitive biases and other people don't. And, and really, the definition of a cognitive bias is, is that you are, are not, uh, you're kind of filtering something through and not, not coming up to what would be the most reasonable or the true answer to something. You're, you're, you're having some thinking issues. Now, how many of you have seen this illusion? Right? Pretty much all of us have seen this. Um, and these two are indeed the same line because I copied and pasted. Trust me. Right? Okay. Um, and so that's the uh, Mueller Lyon eff liar effect. Um, and uh, you know that they're the same length. I mean, I'm telling you to cut off the arrows mentally in your head and don't see them. And trust me, they will be the same length, but you find it very hard to do that. So, you know, it's interesting. I tried this uh, myself, flipping it at different angles just to see whether it affected me because I'm, I like to experiment on myself. And it seems less of a difference between these two when it's at this angle. And, and I think we do have vertical and horizontal uh, receptors in that, you know, this one it seems equally biased. But trust me, they are the same length. That off, and there you can see. Um, so, uh, similarly, because of our the way you know the way that our brain works, um, there are some. I mean, I could say there are uh, biases, but there are illusions that we have because of our, the way our system when kind of thinking works. And I want to go through a few of them so that you can think about their implications for you as you do your work, capital teams. Um, so one of my favorite ones, you know what that acronym stands for? What, what you see is what you see. What you see is all there is. That's right. <laughs> now, how many of you are analysts in the room? Is what you see all there is? Never, right? So analysts in general can be irritating people. <laughs> <laughs> to other people. And I'm serious about this because they keep saying, well, no, there may be more stuff. Um, and uh, I, I don't know that they're, um, I think that they are prone to this cognitive illusion that finds themselves too. But if you, if you are, uh, have this cognitive illusion, if someone gives you, um, uh, you know, uh, someone who is a decision maker, sometimes they make decisions based on, well, gee, the, the outside authority, which can also in, impact them or influence them. And as a consultant, I use that to my advantage, but it's not always a good thing, right? Is that, you know, they made the decisions based on that report from that one consultant. They didn't, you know, has that ever happened to you? You know, where somebody made a recommendation? Well, they didn't look for the other evidence that was going on. So, from a Doing a business analyst point of view, we like to think that tests are specifications these days, right? Um, so, you know, uh, we can have a scenario where an account has sufficient funds and there's, it has insufficient funds and the card has been disabled and the ATM has insufficient funds and if someone, um, uh, suffers from what you see is all there is, they say, oh yeah, these are great acceptance criteria. We've done we had four of these, that's, that's nice, right? Um, and particularly if uh, they're tired and that's all there is, they may say, well, that's, that's done, 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 done. You know, we're just done. That's all we need to think about. 
Um, but I counter it by saying, is, is that all there is? So if you can use itati to counteract uh, what you see is all there is, uh, that can be helpful at various times. So um, there are times when what you see is all there is is a good thing because you make for progress. If someone's always exploring on the outside and you get tired, and that may not be fruitful. So, you know, these things, uh, what, you know, your tend to biases tend to, you know, illusions sometimes work to your advantage. You're very focused. This is what we have to get done. This is great. Don't tell me the other stuff. I just want to get these cases done. I get them implemented. And then there's the analyst who comes in and says, is that all there is? And you, right? Okay. So, since we said system one, thinking is emotional, there, we can have framing effects that presenting even the same facts in different ways can affect us differently. Um, so, um, my favorite one is, um, I don't know if you've had a, a Cadbury pinky candy before, right? 90% fat free, right? 90% no fat, but if you said 10% fat, would you eat that? <laughs> right? Same information, you know? Okay, but it's presented differently. Okay. Um, so be aware, you know, that, that, that actually marketeers and advertising people have known this a long way. And, you know, for a long time, and they've tried to influence our thinking by having a positive emotional response to something in a not thinking point of view, right? Zero percent trans fat, gluten free, fat free, I'll buy it, you know? <laughs> All right, so when someone is presenting things, the same information in the, well, 10% chance of failure versus 90% chance of success, we have a different reaction whether it's framed in a positive or negative way. We just have that reaction, same information. Um, the other thing, too, is a clear confirmation bias. Um, this is really hard to overcome, because you're looking for evidence that supports your point of view, no matter what someone says. I love this Dilbert cartoon, and, and it makes me sad at the same time. Because, OK, let's begin the meeting. Uh, but beware of mine, I'm documenting all of your bullying behavior. Um, I'm not even close to being a bully, but now your confirmation bias will make everything I sound, say sound like bullying to you. And she goes, yeah, can you repeat the part after you reply that I'm a delusional bitch? You know, <laughs> that's right. You don't care what you want to hear. And you'll filter out everything. So dealing with uh, people that are looking for only the evidence that supports their belief. Um, system one uh, illusion that you have, you know, they aren't open-minded, I guess. Is, is really hard to overcome. So we also have another, um, our system when is a good friend of, it's not all evil, it's not all knee-jerk reactions. But one of the things that happens is that um, we're always looking to relate, filter, understand, and trigger our environment. So what we see in front of us affects how we feel or react. Um, and then that current state of what we are causes us to feel and react in the future. So when I see this, uh, show you this word, and then follow it by this, what, what do you see? What, what, what would you fill that out? And what do you think? Soup. Soup? Soap? 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 <laughs> You saw soap or soup? Soap. You said you, you saw soap I, I first. I saw soap first, and then I thought, no, that makes sense. No, no. <laughs> That's interesting. You know, I, I need to write a research journal article on this because, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's weird. Because, then you said, well, no, it has to be soup, right? Yeah, it's interesting. But you said soap. Eat soap. Did your mom wash your mouth out when you were in the there. It wasn't an easy reaction that we really saw that. So I could I got the eat word and then I suddenly saw the when the time so went only on that particular time and I forgot the You did? You forgot? Oh, interesting. Okay. Because eat has become 
I don't know. He I'm going to work here. on this. Yeah. <laughs> it needs a study. It needs a study. I think if I put eat and then uh, had the next thing underneath it, it might have worked eat and so you might have a substitute. But this never works for me, and I've tried it twice now. Okay. So the other thing, too, <clears throat> this one works, though. If I'm seeing someone yawn right in the beginning, right? Uh, right? If you get tired. And it turns out, um, actually, all this controversial study, but if you see someone who slowly gets up out of their chair, um, you will tend to move more slowly when you get up out of your chair. It's kind of a weird thing. Um, and, and what I'm saying is that we're always, in, if we are not just heads down, we are aware of our environment, and priming affects us. So emotional things that come at us, Physical, even how people um, say things is really important because it really primes us for our next kind of knee-jerk almost reaction, which we may have to overcome. Now, one of the, Pollyanna talked about, for those of you who went to our session this morning about, you know, rack and stack, you know, uh, individual uh, performance reviews are evil for Agile because it really makes people um, hard to um, get along and play well together. And it turns out that Kathleen Bose has, has written and done some really interesting research about this, uh, about the effects of monetary rewards even with more than just sophomore uh, psychology students. Right? But, um, you know, she's done experiments well. You know, they pick up fewer pencils that are dropped. You know, if there's this monetary compensation, they won't help somebody. Um, uh, people are supposed to be working together, but they're they are both given monetary rewards for doing some tasks. They'll set their chairs farther apart for those who weren't. You know, just very even like for five bucks, you'll do weird things. Um, and <laughs> you know, so if if money is a motivator, and I've worked on teams where uh, a manager said, well, "Well, there's a bonus when we're done." Um, it it caused very strange behavior of people that were collaborating. Um, uh, people did, became mistrustful, they, they didn't depend on each other. Um, but it does make us persevere longer on difficult tasks, so I don't know about that. Um, but we're more selfish, and I, I've definitely seen that, that happen when money motivators, particularly if it's open, aware, and, dis and disparate. Not everybody gets the same reward. So just be aware of money's timing effects on behaviors. Uh, not, a, not exactly encouraging collaborative work all the time. Um, now, this is a good time of the day to talk about this. Um, system two thinking, so we talked about the cognitive illusions that are there for system one, gets tired out. Um, and I don't think that it's lazy. Kahneman talks about that in this book, but I, I really think that it gets, it's hard work. Um, and so how do we, you know, get less tired when we're doing system two thinking? All right, that, that's one of the things that I like to think about. And certainly skill building, I don't know, how many of you have ever tried to throw a pot on a potter's wheel? How many of our, you are experts at this? Okay, I did it like one day and it was really hard. <laughs> Skill building um, makes a task um, easier. So the more you practice at something, you're better at it, the less tired you can be. Um, and, and so if you're new to a task, like at your work or whatever, and it requires this concentration and skill, the more you practice, you'll get better. But it's tiring in the beginning. It always is tiring. So when people are learning new Agile practices, it can be tiring, actually, for something I've thought about. Um, and so what happens also when you're tired, um, you know, your brain actually is using energy to do that system two sort of thinking, and um, your blood sugar drops and you become cranky. So from an, from an Agile uh, uh, practice, if I have to do a number of system two thinking tasks 
throughout my day, I have to find ways of breaking up uh, so I don't overtire myself. Because if I'm one of these OCD type programmers, I might be compulsively banging my head against the wall and become less effective. So how many of you have heard of the Pomodoro technique? How many of you actually practice Pomodoro? Not very many. So I actually had the inventor of the Pomodoro technique come and visit me at my house, which is a very interesting experience. He spent the weekend with me. He was in town in Portland. And he was having some conversations with me, and he did it in 25 minute chunks. Right? So Pomodoro technique, for those of you not familiar, is so you set a timer, you, you do 25 minutes of your hard thinking or your task at hand, it helps you focus, um, and then when that timer goes off, you stop. You just get away from the keyboard or the conversation or whatever, and go five, five minutes, um, and then come back. Um, and there's some other rules around it if you're, if you're interested in that. So he was trying to Pomodoro me in our conversations. <clears throat> and it turns out that I just want to keep talking. And so the point is, 25 minutes is not a magic, magical number. Um, but when you're in this and you get tired, you can take a break. Um, uh, so, so the idea is to get up, stretch, move around and do things like that. So I was in what I consider the flow and the conversation. But when we're busy, when we're cognitively busy, doing that you know, deep thinking or the system two thinking, we're looking. This is the downside of that. We more, we're more likely to make selfish choices. Right? So we're thinking about me, I'm focused, and make superficial judgments. If someone interrupt us, uh, interrupts us and asks us the question, well, this we're trying to get them out of the way so we can get back to the tough stuff. Right? Um, so I have um, really thought that one of the benefits of pair programming, and any, have you done pair programming? Is it kind of helps us so that we don't get too narrowly focused and by having this sort of bouncing around between roles in pair programming, it's really a good way of and kind of exercising and, uh, you know, yes, we're supposed to say that the person who is the navigator should be doing the work and the other person chipping in, but it allows us to kind of really um, kind of rest and, and work at a very high pace. Um, um, so, so that's just something that I found useful for myself. Um, and when we're doing, if, if you were to characterize system two thinking as, well, it's just lazy, we unconsciously, uh, replace hard questions that we don't know how to answer with simple ones, and we think we're answering the question we originally asked. So sometimes, I actually saw this on the website, I thought it was really great. Um, as a beer and alcohol website, we're prohibited from advertising to minors. Please verify your age to enter how old are you currently. Oh yeah, 21, yeah, sure. Okay, that, is that really answering the question, is that person 21 or not? Uh, but we thought that UI was just great. Anyway, um, so our brains work that too. Um, it worked that way too. Um, so sometimes, like interviewing people for a job, uh, we're looking for their skill and fit with our team. Right? We should be, right? <laughs> but they just might be a good interviewer. Okay? So that's why some uh, teams, you know, have skill based how I work with the team for half a day, kind of, it's grueling from a, it's stressful and challenging for a programmer to do that, and we get more information about how they were going to solve problems or interact um, than, than when you, then they just interview well. Okay, so when you uh, see people doing uh, these substitutes for uh, really answering the question, so you know, the substitution of a simpler question, again, it's like the annoying analyst, right? Uh, do we remember the question we're trying to answer? Uh, have we substituted an easier one for what we're really trying to do? So that was just my uh, bit of advice on, on that. OK, now I'd like, this is again five minute kind of conversation, and this time I hope to have uh, some debriefs or interesting stories about this. I'd, I'd like you to um, 
share a story about your fast and slow thinking exploits. When did one work well for you that you can think about? Um, you know, where did, when did some one time it really worked well? How did you make it be effective at your thinking? Okay, so five minute conversation with someone about that. Yeah. I didn't have this bias. It's still motor spawn, right? Who's got exploits? <laughs> I'd, I'd like to have maybe one or two people kind of, you know, I invite you to share, you know, a, a short story of, of where things work well. Yeah, anybody? Who would like to do that? Go ahead, yes. Okay, so I was at the Art of Leadership Conference and Rudy Giuliani was speaking. Of course, 9-11 is going to come up. And he was talking about all of the work he had done to prepare for different things that happened in New York. So he was setting all these different plans about weird things that happened, like flooding of the lower, lower part of Manhattan, all these ideas. So to me, that was all a lot of system thinking, system two. Mm -hmm. Then he talked about one of his mentors saying that if you do a lot of that kind of thinking and planning, when you're on your feet and it's, you've done so much planning, it becomes instinctual once you're doing an emergency that you don't expect. To me, that would be the system one that you were building from all the humanity. Yeah, yeah that, that's actually, it's interesting about when they, you know, the studies of pilots, you know, one of the reasons why you have checklists um, is because sometimes you may be on you know, autopilot, but also having this automatic response to things can make it more like a system one kind of response. But sometimes that can work against you too, so it's very interesting. Now how about on the, on the job? Anybody have any good stories about how they manage their, their thinking and had good times with it? So you're you're trying fast thinking because let's just not think about it. Let's just do something and then let's let's. But you're consciously setting that up, yeah. aren't you? Yeah, that's a good one. But then what I found with teams is it's a little awkward at first, right? And you can get some of that fast thinking and just get it going. But you know, it, it kicks off the process. But then after the team's been together, let's say for several releases, it's 12 months down the road. Mm -hmm. It's instinctual. You, you very quickly get through the product backlog. And go, oh yeah, that's a three, that's a five. And there's no no more of the, the heavy debate and wondering, you know, what's the right answer. They it just doesn't matter that it's on their experience. It doesn't yeah. matter that it was a 4.2, you know, yeah, right, because exactly. they just did it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I work with, uh, I'm in the development side, I work with the operation side pretty tightly. And it's funny because uh, every time I ask for something, they always say no. System one kicks in for them, the first answer to everything. <laughs> and what's your role? Uh, I'm a development manager. Oh, okay, yeah. So, yeah. and then the first thing is no, and then we start talking about it, and then system two kicks in to all of them, and why are we doing this? And it starts thinking about the possibilities, and usually, sometimes yes, after that, but system one for them is no. Right the first the response is no, yeah. yeah. It's interesting, yeah. So you have to push on with that. Well, you gotta explain, you gotta think about why you're doing something, and that's yeah. the challenge yeah. is, oh, an opportunity. You're just like, no, it can't be done, or well, there might be a reaction, or I don't want to do that. Well, it's always security for them. So mm -hmm. No. The, the worst, if you're not breaking security, if you're not changing anything, you're not breaking anything. So that's uh, what you do. So it's the same thing, that's it. The same thing. The same thing to say no at the start. So you guys are a perfect setup to my last topic about decision making challenges. It's <laughs> so like, I, I was surprised that you came up with like decision making stories. because. I was hoping someone says, how do I concentrate, or how do we get really questions out of analysts, but it was all about decision making. It's very interesting. Um, decision making is hard. Um, and uh, one of the things that can happen, and you were just talking about teams that work well together for a long period of time, is when we are at ease, we can become overconfident. So when something seems easy, we let down our guard. I mean, I hate to say it, but it, it, that's the downside of that. Um, 
And we overestimate the likelihood of rare events, which, you know, it's like the probability of getting Ebola is pretty low. Okay. But, and 30,000 people die in the U.S. on the average from, from flu every year, right? And I still don't have my flu shot. Okay, all right, I need to get my flu shot. All right, and uh, we overreact to potential losses rather than gains. Again, that 90%, 10% fat. Um, and we oftentimes frame problems too narrowly. We just only focus on what we see. And we inappropriately, at times, mistrust our intuitions. So I want to talk a little bit about cognitive ease. I don't have a lot of time to, to go through all of this. But these factors contribute to feeling at ease, I'm not in a happy spot. Now, I love to feel at ease, right? You know, there's nothing wrong with that. But, so if I do something over and over again, and I get ease, or it's clear, you know, it's, it's visually, you know, there's no muddy, murky stuff. It was primed by somebody. Hey, just because you say it over and over again, finally people, oh, yeah. Um, and you're in a good mood, you feel at ease. Okay. Um, and when you're at ease, Things feel familiar, it feels true, it feels good, it feels effortless, it feels right. Okay, so you get the idea of, uh, and it goes backwards too. If things are feeling good, true, and familiar, then you get at ease, and then, um, so it kind of, it's a feedback loop. Um, so, so, just to be aware of that, you know, we judge prob probability of things, since I said, you know, rare events are kind of, we're not really good at, we, we overestimate rare events, and we um, jump to conclusions about things. Um, we judge probability based on, does this fit the stereotypical representation of what we're expecting? Um, and intuitions often are better at guesses, you know? So, you know, most people who act friendly are friendly, right? You know? Right. And uh, tall guys is probably more likely to play basketball than football. Unless they're on the Oregon Ducks football team, where we have like six foot five linemen, you know, really tall. Um, but we're freaky, and um, young men are more likely to drive aggressively than little old ladies. Right? They, they, they do. Okay. Now, and people with PhDs are more likely to subscribe to the New York Times than those who only completed high school. Okay, so those really work for us, you know, because most of the time, things like that. Um, because we're making representative from our, you know, experience. So here's a, it is, Ed Jordan took this photo, that's right, like she's reading the New York Times. Um, he takes pictures of people in New York um, uh, on her e-reader. And that's actually, he has a photo in his Flickr screen about that. Um, and she's reading the New York Times, and there's, there's the e-reader version of the New York Times. Okay, so I'm going to ask you the question, which is more likely? Does she have a PhD or she does not have a college degree? So you think it's, she has a PhD? Well, so here's the thing about this. If you were to actually think about this logically, you may not know, but I mean, you, most people would say, yeah, if I have to come to a snap judgment, I think she has a PhD, here she is. She's also wearing glasses, so I kind of find you there. Um, but you have to think how many people read the New York Times, um, and how many people have PhDs that are riding the subway in New York, and when it comes out to it, if you figure it out, the answer is there's a lot more high school graduates reading the New York Times, and you're likely to spot a P. But we don't think that way because we're making representative uh, judgments is our first thing reaction unless you think more deeply about it. Um, okay, so here's, here's something, you know, what do you think? Julie is a senior at a university and she was, she read fluently when she was four. What's her current GPA? You ask this one. What? She's a Pontius, 2.1. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, we're, we're being contrary. But if you if you ask this question to people and say, give me a number, and they're not being contrary, and they're always people who are outliers, they'll say it's pretty high. So how do you come up with an answer? What we're doing is we're looking for a causal link, right? 
right, causal, causal links between evidence, her reading, and her prediction, right? So we're making predictions, right, based on what we think. Um, so how precocious was Julie when she's four? Is that likely to continue? Well, no, she's a party girl, well, but substitute, and so we do the substitution that he's a, she's a pre uh, precocious reader, um, and, 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 and maps that smart, really smart little kid going to likely have a higher GPA. should say precocious reader. And that's how we come up with those things. And we do that without thinking, unless we're the contrary in the room, okay, who always questions everything. Um, so, you know, I, I love this. You know, I used to think uh, correlation implied causation, then I took a statistics class. Now I don't know. Sounds like the class helped. Well, maybe. We're really bad at this stuff. <laughs> We're really bad at this stuff. So, if we have these extreme predictions that we have to make, I hope your managers never ask you to do such things, what you should say, do I have any useful evidence that could counteract that or not? No, then just choose the baseline. Well, I know that there's more New York readers that are of a certain age, you know, because I know the relative uh, PhD and whatever, and I should have chosen the baseline of it's a high school graduate. Should have chosen that answer. Just, okay. If there is some evidence, are you confident about that evidence? Right? And if you are, then stick with your prediction. But if you aren't, then you're supposed to readjust it to in between. Or maybe she's a 3.0, right? And that's really a logical way of uh, doing, get counteracting your representative uh, biases and predictions. Now that takes system two thinking, by the way. <laughs> you can't just do this in a major way. Um, so the other thing is that when you, um, you know, want to learn and improve as a team, uh, we learn because there are stable things. We do this, this happens. We do this, this happens. We do this, this happens. Well, if you do this and that happens and something else happens and whatever, you don't have a stable learning environment. It just seems chaotic, right? Um, so when there are no stable regularities to learn from, and this is program managers, people who are estimating, whatever, um, lots of time to learn and practice, yeah, then your intuition is likely skilled intuition, and it's going to be pretty good for you. So if they don't have any retrospectives after they, they do their planning poker, right, ever, to learn how off they were or whatever, uh, or why they weren't, you know, why was this off or not, then they're not learning, right? So actually retrospectives are a good thing when you think about it. So um, one other thought about um, reactions that people have is so, like we perceive pain of loss infinitely more traumatic than we do pleasure from games. So while we're delivering features, people go, oh yeah, that's great. But it doesn't last very long. We say, oh no, you can't have that. Right? You can't deliver that feature. Just when they thought they were going to have it, they lose it. Boy, people get very upset. Okay, so um, one of the things to think about, and I'm just going to close on one or two more thoughts here, is that a pre-retrospective, and people have um, been doing this in various different, can help uh, surface risks and get us to respond more, uh, or, you know, out of the box, uh, thoughtfully about them. And so they actually called it in. Uh, this is a Forming a project uh, pre-mortem, how to do that, but I don't like pre-mortems, I don't like post-mortems. Uh, uh, so I retitled it pre-retrospective, is that you get a knowledgeable group, and what you do, if you have a big decision, imagine a year from now that we implemented our plan and it was a disaster. So that's the, it's just like, um, you know, thinking about the worst thing possible that Linda talked about. And write your history about the last year of what happened for five to ten minutes. So you're doing it solo, and then you share, and then you say, well, is that really going to happen now? And you lose your creativity to see what could happen, how could we overcome those risks. 
And then people, because they imagine and tell a story of how they got to the bad place, then can be much better at getting to a possible ways of even surfacing the risks in which they might not have even talked about, and then um, reacting and search for counteracting. So I, I actually found very clients that was actually a very interesting kind of thing to do. So if you have big decisions and you're not sure about talking about risks, and you're not sure that you're going to estimate things or predict them, that you're going to use representative thinking rather than just really thinking through the upstream you need to do. We can reframe the way you think. And in fact, um, if I want to rethink something, there's a recipe for this. Step back, we do this with agile retrospectives, ask a question about what happened, and consider how were you looking at the world? Right? What lens were you using as you thought about this? And state what was unspoken assumptions and beliefs that you had and then restate what you know using system one and two thinking. Well, I thought that way because my system one kicked in and I had this reaction to uh, the development manager coming over to me. And um, you know, so if you know about system one and two thinking and you want to reframe how you're feeling, thinking, and doing about something, you can follow this recipe. My assumption was it would really, everything they bring us will break. You know, but you have to have a lot of trust to do this sort of reframing in, in a group. But this is something that when you get really collaborative and trusting, can be very powerful. So um, just an example of why do we make that low of an estimate? You know, all right, let's go do this reframing exercise. <coughs> oh, we have a can-do attitude. We've been successful. Uh, we've also read. In this case, for a software decision, we've offered, ah, we've read a good review of that framework, we've noodled around with it, it seems like it's fun. My favorite authorities, blog, whoever that is, because actually external authorities have a new influence on teams. And the assumption is we want to believe we can really do this more quickly using the new framework, right? So that's why we say, well, it'll only take us two weeks if we use Angular. <coughs> Um, so you think about this and you say, well, maybe we're too optimistic. Let's consider a lack of experience, right, and revisit our estimate. Right? Maybe we need to perform an experiment, right? So that's a way of thinking about reframing. Uh, what are our, what's our frame? Well, we have this positive attitude. We, we recognize that actually authority, external authorities have a biases to certain things we probably need to. We, we like to believe that we can do anything, so that's what we did. Um, so I want to end with just a thought or two. Sorry for going over, but it's not fast versus slow. It's fast and slow. It happens all the time. They interact. And you can exploit both types of thinking. So for example, if you are in a comfortable group, and your context is staying the same, your estimates do get better. When you get something new, and if you have time to learn, uh, that's great. Uh, things that you, the more skilled you get, the less system two thinking you have to do. When you need to do system two thinking, you gotta be aware of its emotional biases and things that come in from system one. You want to counteract those fast thinking quirks, but you can't control them. They're just there. Um, and so if you need to do a lot of system two thinking, you need to strengthen and give a lot of support for that and, and allow time and space for that. Okay. And with that, that's it. Exploit. And this was about exploiting fast and slow thinking. There's two advantages to take advantage, especially unethically or unjustly from one's own ends. I didn't mean that, all right? The other definition is exploit is to make the best use of it. And that's what we're trying to do, is to exploit our thinking. Okay, thank you.